This is on Austrian capital theory, and as you can see in the subtitle, it's a prelude, prelude to capital-based macroeconomics. More specifically, a, a prelude to discussion on Austrian theory of the business cycle. Although in my own writings, in Time and Money, I make it clear that uh, capital-based macroeconomics has a lot more to say about other parts of the economy than just uh, business cycles. But business cycles are the most fully developed of the Austrian school, so I want to uh, focus on that uh, this afternoon. Um, let's go here. I'm going to start with two views. Uh, the Hayekian stages of production model, and you've already seen a lot about that from uh, Professor Salerno. I might, I might give a little different spin on it, but not much. Uh, and then the Knightian, and in parentheses I say Friedmanian, stock flow model. That's, that's the alternative uh, as far as looking at Hayek and Friedman uh, is concerned. So we'll try to give that a pretty good workout. I say two views. Well, yeah, there they are. There are two of them. I could have put a third view in. Let me do it uh, right here. The Keynesian view, it's animal spirits model. And that, uh, that doesn't quite pass muster as a model, actually. But if you've read the general theory, and uh, let me show uh, a show of hands. How many have read the general theory? Great. That's great. Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it turns out that uh, over a span of a page and a half, um, he used the term animal spirits to give you an idea of movements of investment. Uh, is investment picking up or is it slowing down? And it's all run by what he calls animal spirits. Well, <laughs> That doesn't fit well very, you know, analytically into a macro model. But we'll have something to say about that uh, too. Okay. Now, I'll start by just indicating that there's many meanings of capital. And I'm just going to give you a few. If you've, if you've read Bon Bavarque, I won't ask how many people have read all of Bon Bavarque. <laughs> but... <laughs> He goes through quite a, a list of different things that capital mean or have meant and, and so on in the literature. But uh, I'm just going to go through a few and then, and then focus on two particular meetings. Bank, capital, that's just assets minus liabilities. Uh, here we have financial capital, uh, cash and funds raised by, say, stock and bond sales. Fixed capital, plant and equipment, the fixed just implies durable, a big machine that'll last 30 years or, or whatever. Uh, working capital, that's goods in process. Uh, an automobile that's halfway put together and is on its way down the assembly line, that's working capital. Capitalized value. That's just the present value of future uh, receipts. And human capital, that's more recent in the literature, the present value of skilled workers' future earnings. They've got skills, and they have those skills right now, and that constitutes human capital that they can apply it in the years and months ahead. Okay. Now I'm getting serious because I'm underlining things. See, that's, my, that's the clue. Capital stock, okay? Uh, the stock of productive factors that yield a flow. There's the other underline uh, of consumption goods. And this is the Frank Knight view. And it's, it's just defined dimensionally. In other words, a stock is something that exists right now. There it is. That's the stock. The flow... Uh, is on its way out. You know, it, it, it's uh, making the, the goods go out the door and so on. That's the flow.
flow. And we'll get to something even more severe than that, all right? So what we're going to focus on uh, in today's lecture is that distinction between the structure on the one hand, that's the Austrians, and the stock and flow uh, on the other hand. So that's, that's Friedman and Knight, or, uh, well, yeah, that's the best contrast that I want, want to be making. Now, there's a problem in measuring capital, and I, I want to spend a little time on this to convince you of, that it is a problem, and it's unique to capital. And so you start out easy. Uh, capital is heterogeneous. Well, who would disagree with that? Okay, Of course it is. But you might come back with the claim that, well, so is labor and so is land. Right? So why is capital being heterogeneous such a big deal? So aren't label, labor and land homogeneous too? Well, yes, they are. So we go to the next step. Capital is radical, radically heterogeneous. That sounds like something Ludwig Lachmann would write, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I'll go a step forward and say, well, we could ask just how radical is capital heterogeneous, okay? And the answer is it's dimensionally heterogeneous. We just don't have the dimensions that we would like to have uh, to give a, a meaningful measure of capital. And, and let me uh, elaborate by giving you a fill-in-the-blank assignment. Here it is. And you see that the sentences are all alike except what goes in that uh, blank. So not all what? Well, units. We need some units in there. Okay, what are the units? Start at the top. Worker hours. Okay, that's standard. Now, I'm allowing for labor to be heterogeneous because it says not all are alike. Okay, that means they're heterogeneous. But at least we have a unit where we can indicate what, just what the units are. And realize that some worker hours are more productive than others and so on, but they're worker hours. And how about uh, land? What do we do here? Acres, or we could say acre years. You see that in some textbook, and that would be more uh, in line with worker hours and labor and acre years. But land is heterogeneous too, which means not all acres of land are alike. Now we get into the real problem. Not all what of capital are alike. What would you What would you say? Well, look look at what's there very closely, and you can see one way the textbook authors uh, treat this. They just remove the parentheses. Okay. <laughs> Not all units of capital are alike. Well, I mean, you know, if you're reading through that at eleven thirty or midnight uh, in your dorm. You read right past it and say, oh, yeah, units, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are they? You don't, you don't know, okay? Well, not all units are alike. So if you're taking notes, write down unit is not a unit, <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, I've become sensitized in the, in the literature to see what else people have. We could look at... Uh, some say doses, some doses of cat. Well, how big is a dose? <laughs> what else we got? Chunks. <laughs> and hunks, okay? <laughs> and you can look at some other units and see if any gallons or whatever, you can't see anything that would work. And if you, if you look at these units that are used, you're, you're kind of leery that they would work. Let me show you. There's a dose. Could you measure capital that way? Okay. How about a hunk? I mean, some hunks are bigger than other hunks, all right? Or some chunks are bigger than other chunks. And what about a hunk? 
That's human capital, I guess. <laughs> Okay, now let's get to two combatants here, which is Frank Knight and Friedrich Hayek on the issue of capital. And soon enough, we'll have Friedman uh, involved because he's picking up the Frank Knight idea of capital. Uh, and it's important to note that, that uh, Friedman and Frank Knight uh, were colleagues at, at the University of Chicago. And uh, Frank Knight was a very dominant figure there. And we'll see that with Stigler's book and, and so on as we go along. He's very dominant there. He's very emphatic about just how to theorize about capital. And I can tell you at this point that there was a time in the late 40s or 1950, long in there somewhere, where Friedman, I'm sorry, where Hayek uh, was trying to get a, a position at the University of Chicago in the economics department. And it turns out that they wouldn't have him. They wouldn't have him. And they didn't, they wouldn't have him because of his capital theory. They didn't want someone who was the author of prices and production. Uh, which is antithetical, antithetical to uh, Knight's view of capital. Uh, okay. Now, the argument, or the in in the journals, there were articles about capital theory, Hayek's capital theory, uh, and. Uh, Several different capital theories, but the but the emphasis uh, was back on our old Frank Knight. Okay, and it turns out that before that, a number of years, look at the dates, back in the mid 1800s, uh, that same battle was waged with Bon Bever, the Austrian, and John Bates Clark that actually was the forerunner of the theory that Knight picked up on. And so this has a long uh, history of these two views of capital, stock flow on the one hand and the structure of production on the other. So my sympathies are my uh, choice, of course, is Bon Bavarek, although I have good feelings about Clark, if only because he looks just like my grandfather, okay? <laughs> Kind of sweet. <laughs> okay. Now, let me give you an idea. I don't know if you can read that from the back. What about production time in a Clark Knight vision as opposed to Bon Bavere Kayak vision? Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, the claim is, let me give you the claim to start with so uh, you're not jarred into it later is that production time doesn't count for anything. And it goes like this. Imagine trees being planted and harvested. Uh, and here's the story. Once a steady state is reached, and I underline that because that's, that's key. That's key. Nothing else follows uh, unless you start with that. Once a steady state is reached, production time is irrelevant, okay? And notice uh, irrelevant is in quotes. I'll have to explain that later, but it's in quotes. Production time is irrelevant. And so the trees have a linear maturity structure. Actually, it's log linear, but we'll get them, let them get away with that. Uh, each period a, sampling, a sapling is set out and a mature tree is harvested. All right, let's see how that goes. Here's year one, and watch right under year one sign, we'll get a sapling, we set that out. And then look at the other end and we harvest that other tree. There it is, okay? Uh, 
And then the next period presents us with the same maturity profile. So watch the trees. There they go up, okay? So if you got the same forest the next year that you had this year. And so Knight writes, it's, it's the setting out that enables, with quotation marks, the harvesting. And so setting out the, sam the sapling now produces, in quotation marks, the harvestable tree now. All right. So production and consumption are simultaneous. I trust you to notice the quotation marks. Okay. So that's that's their story. That's Clark's story. That's uh, that's th that's just the whole story. All right. Now George Stigler, of all people. Now Stigler, of course, was. Uh, a colleague at University of Chicago too. Very, Friedman and Stigler were very good friends. So Stigler defends Clark and dismisses Bon Beverk on the basis of the simultaneous product of production and consumption. And here's what he writes. Look at this. Here's a, this is Stigler. We can say that any one row of trees takes 50 years to mature, but since there is a constant output of timber forever, there's simply no point in saying it. Now, isn't that amazing? And in fact, it's only true if you make the very, you know, the dramatic assumption about a steady state. So that Stigler production, or <laughs> George Stigler production and distribution theories of 1941. Uh, I made the mistake, and maybe I shouldn't call it a mistake, but uh, I was at a Mont Pelerin meeting some years ago, and sitting at a dinner table with Stigler just across the table from me. And Stigler was carrying on about uh, how it is that we don't really need that much history of thought, although he writes a lot of it, uh, because the theories in the past, if they're any good, we've still got them, and if they're no good, we've gotten rid of them. So why do we really need to study all that history of economic thought? And so I came up with what I thought was an exception and, and I came up with this, not having read Stigler's book. <laughs> and so I mentioned Hayek and stages of production and how that all fell to the wayside. And Stigler just exploded. <laughs> and let me know that, no, that's, that's something that needed to, needed to fall away. It was not viable. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so once the steady state has reached, production is irrelevant and, and so on. They carry on. You can read it. Production and consumption are... So here's what Stigler said about 43 years after his 41 book. And this is interesting. He says, I wrote my dissertation in the history of economic thought under Frank Knight. He was so strong-minded and so critical a student of literature that he was a good many years, it was a good many years before I could read the economic classics through my own eyes instead of his. I never brought myself to read through my doctoral dissertation, that was at distribution theories, production, yeah, yeah there's the title, because I knew I would be embarrassed by both the 90 and excesses and its immaturity. <laughs> So he's sort of disclaiming it without ever out actually reading it, you know. But it shows what kind of a, an effect that Knight had on Stigler and on all the other economists, essentially, uh, at University of Chicago at the time. Okay. 
Now, I call it black box capital theory because, I mean, it's one thing to talk about these trees. It's a very specific uh, example, and it's, it only works if you assume a steady state and so on. But that sort of gets dropped out of the wayside, and, and you have just a capital stock, and from the stock, a flow. All right? So that's the idea. So this is black, I call it black box capital theory. And I'll show you a black box that you've, you've seen on TV occasionally. Flight recorder. How black is it? Okay. It's orange. Okay. <laughs> but black box actually has a meaning totally apart from the color of, of the case. Black box just means it's, it's, an, it's an electrical engineering term. Okay. Black box means that the user, someone that buys the box and sticks it in the airplane, the user has no reason or no ability to get inside the black box and see what's there. So it's black in that sense. It's hidden from the user. You don't know what's in there. But you hope it's what, you know, you hope it has the function that it's supposed to have. So that's, that's the black box idea, all right? So it, the definition of black box then is any complex piece of equipment, typically a plug and play unit, in an electronic system, the specific context of which the user has no need to know, okay? So this is the way <clears throat> that Stigler and Friedman and others at Chicago sort of put away all of the issues of capital. It's just in a black box, okay, that's, we'll leave it where it is, okay, and not worry about it and go on. Now. I have a suspicion. I, I can give you a couple of reasons uh, why Stigler, I'm sorry, why, why Friedman signed on for the black box and, and never changed that. He never, he never doubted that that's what he wanted. And one of the reasons is what I've already shown is that there's no usable units. You know, you could say my dollars worth of a piece of capital, but that just that just mixes the value of it with the amount of it, okay? So you, but you don't have any units to talk about the amount of capital. You, you keep it in that black box and don't worry about it. That's the idea. So uh, I've got no doubt, given how mathematical that the Friedman modeling was, that he, he did not want to have to measure units of capital because he wouldn't, he wouldn't know whether it was the same old capital that now is worth more, okay? Or it could even be worth less, but it's actually more in volume. But what is the volume? How do you measure it? You don't know. So just keep it in that black box. That's one reason that, uh, that he just clinged on to that, that particular theory. The other reason is one that I, I hesitate to mention because it, it, it amounts to psychologizing. And I, I, I don't like to do that. I'm, I just don't do psychologizing. And I won't do psychologizing, except for today. Okay. <laughs> and it goes like this. And this is, this is kind of a neat because it's, it's an I'm an Austrian economist, but this is an empirical study uh, that I'm going to offer you. And it, and it goes like this. Uh, it, it's about economists that marry one another, husband and wife, both of which are economists. And I know a lot of those couples. It's kind of sad, actually. But... <laughs> <laughs> My wife is a flutist. I don't tell her how to play the flute, you know. <laughs> So we get along great, okay? Now, you might know, you probably, some, most of you probably do, or some of you probably do, that Rose Friedman was also an economist. She was working on a PhD 
at the University of Chicago. That's where they met, okay? Uh, and I read, I can ask it, who's read this book? A uh, big, thick book written by Friedman, both of them, Milton and Rose. It was called Two Lucky People, okay? And I bought the book and read it. Uh, and it turns out that for years, for years, Rose Friedman was working on a dissertation. And usually she'd start working again when they moved. They, they move and okay, she'd, now let me start working on this again, then move again and so on. So a number of times she kept working on this dissertation. And the dissertation was about capital theory. And who do you think her dissertation director was? It's Frank Knight, okay? Now, here's, here's the empirical part. I think, I think it's empirically almost dead sure that a married couple will get along fine with one another only if they stay out of each other's concentration in economics, okay? <laughs> so Milton didn't say anything about, <laughs> anything bad about uh, Friedman's capital theory. He stayed out. They were two happy people, I mean, two lucky people. Yeah, if, if he had denied that that was a good capital theory, they may not have been so lucky. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that might have had something to do with it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go on. Let's see what we've got here. So this is my capital stock. It's same color anyhow. And we, oh, we need to add, add do not open, all right? And then, let me get something going. There it is. You've got the flow of consumption and the maintenance of capital. See, so you get a feedback. And in fact, that maintenance has to be just right so that the capital stock doesn't increase or doesn't decrease. It just stays the same. And that's the steady state, isn't it? Uh, and so you can see what's in green, uh, that's the flow of consumption. And then the stock plus, plus the maintenance uh, are the stock of capital. And the claim is, by night, is, is, the, is that the maintenance is just a technical detail. It's a technical detail. You, you'd think it wasn't, but it, and by making it a, detect, uh, a technical detail, then he, he can get his notion of, of his uh, stock flow. Okay, let's go on. All right. So <clears throat> I put a box around this because both of those things, the actual capital stock plus the maintenance, uh, is what Knight is taking to be uh, capital. Okay, so the capital stock includes maintenance uh, as a technical detail. Again, there is a technical in quotes. Uh, hence, the stock of capital is permanent, and that's in quotes. Now, it drove me nuts reading night to see all these quotes like this. And uh, I learned from Jerry O'Driscoll. He was a, one of our early Austrians that wrote a dissertation in, at UCLA. Uh, and he, he clued me in to some of the, uh, of the ways that, that, uh, that Knight expressed himself. And so Knight would say, capital stock is permanent in a sense. Okay, you can see this all through his writing. Sometimes he would say, uh, the stock is permanent as it were, okay? <laughs> the stock is permanent, so to speak. 
<laughs> Wait a minute. You get tired of saying that and you just put quotation marks on them. Okay. okay. So a permanent capital stock yields a perpetual flow. That's the idea. And of course the qualifications are in a sense, as it were, so to speak. <laughs> that's a strange capital theory, but that's it, okay? Now, we even go a step further here. Um, we've got capital stock and the flow of consumption. But what's, what Knight really liked to do is change this to sources. He calls it sources yielding services. And that's, that seems like a sort of a roundabout way of putting things. There's sources, so we don't call it capital, we call it sources. And, and then he says, there's only one factor of production. This is odd. It's capital, okay, in the broad sense of sources. So land, labor, and capital are all capital in the broad sense. So in other words, labor means the labor's ability to work, whether you're actually working or not. That's, that's the capital aspect of it. And so we change the, the, the maintenance to sources, you gotta maintain, maintain sources, and you have a flow of services. Now you might wonder, what, what's the difference going from consumption, let's say, to, to services. Well, one thing you could do is take, you know, the production, let's say, of refrigerators, and then the refrigerator becoming a consumption good, all right? But it's a good, it's something, and it is a durable good. Knight doesn't want it to be durable. He wants it just the services of the refrigerator. That's, that's what we're looking at, not the whole refrigerator. It's just the current services of it. And the sources of it, the sources of that service, of course, are the refrigerator. That's the way it works. And so it's, it's really a definite or a dimensional difference. One's a stock and one's a flow, one, and to, in, in the extreme, okay? It goes like that. Now, this is going to be challenging, but I think we can do it. Uh, I'll call that sources again and maintenance of sources and services. And I'm going to read this, but you can't just start reading the thing. Uh, you have to realize that it's, it's full of sources and services, enough to make your head swim. And it helps if you identify where those are right now. So there they all are. And this is a quote by Milton Friedman. In other words, Friedman doing his capital theory has cabbage on to night, and he's doing, he, he's doing it in terms of services and sources. And then the, the key thing I've underlined uh, is at the same time, this is stuff that's all happening at once, okay? There's no time. Well, let's see if I can read it. I'm not sure I can, but... The key feature, and he's talking about of the process in which interest rates have been lowered, and that's what sets off a business cycle, okay? At least the Austrian thinks it sets off a business cycle, but Friedman doubts it, because the key feature of the process is that it tends to raise the price of sources of both producer and consumer services relative to the prices of the services themselves. It therefore encourages the production of such sources and at the same time, the direct acquisition of the services rather than of the sources. Are you with me? Uh, <laughs> but these reactions in their turn tend to raise the price of the services relative to the price of sources so that that is to undo the initial effects on the interest rate and that's all at once, okay? So as soon as that interest rate goes down, then, then just in a flash, all of that happens. And it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference in anything from that, from that point on. Uh, and that's Friedman, okay? 
Now, to be fair about this, that, let's see, it goes on, there's, there's one more part of it where he's not talking about it. He says, the final result may be a rise in expenditures in all directions without any change in the interest rate of all. Well, how could it be any change? Because it went down and up in a split second. <laughs> there wasn't any time for it. Okay, No change at all in the interest rate. Interest rates and asset prices may simply be the conduit through which the effect of monetary change is transmitted to expenditures without being altered at all. And of course what happens is, is that the interest rate is altered over a fairly large point in a, a span of time uh, until it finally does adjust uh, to its old level. And maybe not even quite its own level because a lot of uh, misallocation has gone on in between. And it's true that if all of this change in interest rate happens at once, both down and up, yeah, there's no effect, right? Now, in fairness to, to Friedman, in this same section, uh, in, in the article, the 1961 article that I'm citing, in the same section, he talked about how things would be different if you're, if you're thinking in terms of building, uh, building some kind of an industrial building or creating machines or doing things that actually do take time. Well, of course, it would be very different. In fact, that's the thing that is the focus of the Austrians in seeing what's going on, okay? Uh, and yet he drops that. You know, he, he says that, but it doesn't become part of his theory. Uh, he sticks with uh, the Knightian view, a strange thing. Okay. Now, another strange thing. Let me do that again. Felt good. Um, even though Knight thinks of that uh, that feedback as a technical issue, he does allow that it can be more than enough uh, to keep the capital intact, okay? Or it could be less than enough to keep the capital intact. Well, those would have to be decisions, wouldn't they? You know, you could over-maintain or under-maintain or whatever. That'd be decisions. Well, how is it that it's, it's, it's technical if, if it just keeps it intact, but you have the choice of beefing it up or letting it, or let it, letting it run out, okay? And, but if you do let it run, if you do beef it up, you get something like this, okay? And if you let it go the other way, you get something like this. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> so, so that would have to be a matter of choice, right? Where are we time-wise? Yeah. So here's the summary. Uh, <clears throat> Knight and Hayek. So maintenance is a technical detail, but we may, we're wondering about that last slide or so, okay? Hayek, maintenance is a matter of choice. You can, you can run the thing day and night if you want to get some products out the door for some specific reason and waste away your machine. Capital is permanent. No. Capital, capital depreciates, but is augmentable. Beef it up, replace it, and so on. Capital is the only factor. Well, that didn't make any sense. Capital is heterogeneous and multi-specific. Production time is irrelevant, with quotation marks, and production time is the key variable. You'll see in a later lecture uh, how Hayek and Friedman use the word key 
uh, Friedman is the empiricist, of course. And when he says key variable, he means it moves around a lot. And, and so we can, we can do econometrics with it, right? But Hayek is saying production is the, production time is the key variable. It's all about sources and services. That's night. It's all about temporal capital structure. It's about stocks and flows. No, it's about dynamic market processes. You couldn't get a bigger contrast of two capital theories than that. Okay, I've got a few minutes and I want to, oh, here's something. As reported by Mark Skousen in his Vienna and Chicago, Larry Wimmer, he's an economist, uh, an early 60s PhD candidate at the University of Chicago, reports that Austrian capital theory was one of those subjects verboten at Chicago. They didn't want to hear about it. Okay? Now, a little bit about Menger's Law, and I'm going to breeze through this because you've heard a lot from Joe Salerno. Uh, there's uh, the goods of different orders. Okay, consumption goods at the bottom and higher order goods along the top. Production proceeds in this diagram, and it's it's consistent with Minger. Production proceeds top to bottom, and value imputation goes bottom to top. Joe covered some of this stuff. And I'm superimposing the page in Hayek's uh, Prices in Production that lines up with what I've already shown you. And you have orders of goods. Just clean it up like that. And the one thing that's kind of odd about this is that when you're using that diagram, it looks like time is coming down the vertical axis. Okay? That, I mean, that's, that's the direction of the actual production. Time is coming down the vertical axis. It almost makes you wonder what time does when it bumps up against the origin. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something, it's not a graph that you're used to seeing, okay? And sometimes it can be a, an obstacle to people figuring out how this consumption or how this works. Now, Walter Block has claimed several times to an audience like this that I solved this problem. I solved the problem and getting, getting away with time coming down the vertical axis. And I did, I did. I worked on it, I worked on it, and I came up with a solution. And I wanna see what you think about it. <laughs> 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 there it is, okay. So now time goes from left to right and the value is the other way. All right. Uh, we make a Hayekian triangle out of it. Production time and a sequence of changes. And if you want something more, compl more complex, look at that one. That's out of uh, Hayek's Pure Theory of Capital. Uh, my, myself, I, 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 I like that one. Okay. <laughs> okay, I need to stop right there. Thank you much.